I am one of your biggest fanboys, the author of the Dynamo DB book. I chased you down at reInvent. It's like, hey, Alex, it's me. What multi-tenancy is and, and, and why it's so important. The ability to share underlying resources so that you're not doing repetitive or duplicative work. How much do you know about Elasticsearch? What would you like to know? <laughs> if you could master one skill you don't have right now, what would it be? Um, so many. <laughs> Hey folks, this is Alex, and today's episode is with Quaja Shams. Quaja is the CEO and co-founder at Memento, which is a serverless cache, and he's a friend of mine. I just love chatting with him because, you know, if I ever have a question about distributed systems or AWS, he's, he's a really good resource on that. He used to lead the DynamoDB team at AWS, uh, and now he's doing Memento. And, you know, we just talk about a lot of different things in here, including multi-tenancy and cellular architecture and what it's like to build on AWS and, and, and you know, sell infrastructure products to end customers and um, just a lot of really good stuff here. So I love this episode. Hope you do, too. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, guests you want on the show, anything like that, feel free to reach out to me or to Sean. And with that, let's get to the show. Kwaja, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex, for having me. Always a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. So you are the CEO and co-founder at Memento. But I'd say like more importantly, you're you're a friend that I've met. Uh, yeah, I met two years ago, I think. And you're just like the person I go to when I have like deep systems questions, distributed systems, just like or how AWS works or all these sorts of things. So I'm excited to sort of get you on here and take some of our conversations that we have or some of the dumb questions that I have and like just like make them public because I think a lot of people should should know this stuff. Uh, but with that background, maybe just tell us a little bit about you and and what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's humbling to hear you describe me like that because I am one of your biggest fanboys, the author of the <laughs> Dynamo DB book. I chased you down at reInvent. It's like, hey, Alex, it's me. Um, so I, I appreciate your, your, your kind words. Um, I've been following you for a lot longer. Um, so my name is Kwaja. I uh, started my career building cameras on board the Mars rovers, got tired of hardware because I'm impatient. And I like to see things happen right away. That instant gratification really drives me. So I started doing image processing uh, for all the Mars rover images that were coming back. Got impatient again of all the data centers and dealing with ordering hardware and whatnot and became one of the earliest AWS production customers. This was back in 2008, 2009 timeframe. And back when all of AWS was one solutions architect and got to work very deeply with a bunch of AWS teams and uh, just been part of this journey of, uh, of cloud uh, adoption since the, since the very beginning and inspired by it. 2013, I joined Amazon, I ran DynamoDB, and then I ran all the video services for AWS Cloud. Gotcha, yep. And, and what are you up to now? Uh, today, I run a small startup called Momento. We build a serverless caching product. Um, we offer key value store, data structures, and low latency pops up. The underlying hypothesis just goes back to the instant gratification. I think people should build things and infrastructure should just get out of the way. That's what inspired me about AWS and cloud. That's why I left NASA to join AWS. And I really think if people can make developers more productive, they can really change the world. So that's what we try to do at Momento specifically narrowing in on caching and low latency messaging. Gotcha. Absolutely. So one thing that you've brought up a number of times when, when we've chat, I've seen you write about it and all this, this uh, all, all over the place is this idea of multi-tenancy and just like how powerful that is in, in systems and infrastructure. So maybe just give folks an overview of like what multi-tenancy is and, and, and why it's so important. Yeah. Multi-tenancy is the ability to share underlying resources so that you're not doing repetitive or duplicative work. And, you know, just to be clear, where I go for my inspiration on multi-tenancy is a set of Mark Brooker's blogs. Mark Brooker, Andy Warfield, they've just done incredible work just explaining why multi-tenancy works really, really well at the infrastructure level, but it's all around us in life as well. So, you know, something as, you know, starting with like when you provision an EC2 instance, you're sharing the data centers, you're sharing the rack, you're not getting an entire rack. So whether you like it or not, multi-tenancy is in your AWS. If you're not, if you're not even on AWS, you have your own data center, well, you're probably not producing your own power. So multi-tenancy is there. If you are drinking water that you're not collecting from rain, that's coming from a multi-tenanted source. Same thing with the internet inside of your house. So when you look all around, multi-tenancy surrounds us and it is the way that people make 
consumption of resources more efficient, which results in better availability, better performance, and just an overall better consumer experience. So that's multi-tenancy at a, at a high level. Yeah. And I, I can sort of like get that. And I think most people would get that and be like, hey, yeah, I don't want to go, you know, grow all my own uh, food or or gather my own water or that sort of thing. But I think like where it would sort of break down or surprise people or like engineers and things like that is is you mentioned EC2 and that makes sense too. I don't want to run my own data center. So it makes sense that someone else does. I have my own EC2 instance. But I think then you, you like at DynamoDB, at Memento are taking that a step for, further where it's like, hey, you're not even renting your own instance, you're like getting a shared service where, you know, there's a bunch of instances and sort of, um, you know, all customers are sort of sharing all this stuff in like this multi-tenant system. Yeah. In the early days, it was kind of great that you didn't need to rent your own data center space to get an access to one more instance. It was available to you instantly, right? That's that's why they were called instances. So the EC2 instances were available to you instantly without having to build things. Now that was fundamentally a, uh, a much more efficient way to consume resources. But then, you know, a few years down the line, what, what we realized is that you can make things even more efficient. So when you run a Lambda, right? Um, so even with EC2, what people were doing is they would provision an instance, but even that instance may run idle most of the time. And if you are sharing capacity at the instance level, it leaves room for, for further efficiency. So some instances might be running really heavy on CPU. Some might be running really heavy on memory. Some might be running really, really heavy on networking. And some might just be you know idle most of the time. So if you zoom in and if you increase the granularity at which the multi-tenancy is occurring, lots of optimizations come your way. So as an example, when you provision, uh, when you start to use S3, you're not provisioning a bunch of machines and drives for your S3 bucket. You don't start by saying, how many S3 capacity units do you need for your bucket? You literally create a bucket and you start writing. And that allows AWS and any, you know, it, wh whoever the storage providers are, it allows them to manage utilization of that capacity at a much, much, you know, finer grain. Because now they can make sure that, you know, if some, uh, some drives are, are more consumed than others, that they can kind of spread the load and you don't have, you know, provision S3 hard drives that are just sitting there idle across millions of different customer accounts. So that's where, you know, you zoom in and you start doing capacity management at resource at, at granularity that is finer, finer than an instance. And this is why you, it's really, really hard to beat S3 for really low cost, incredibly durable storage. Yeah. Speaking of, did you see that there is someone trying to beat S3? There's like a new S3 um, competitor, man, Tigris, I believe it came, it came out just like last week. Have you seen this? Yeah, I mean, uh, S3, uh, Tigris is great, by the way. And um, there's been lots and lots of people trying to reproduce and replicate S3 and also building on top of S3, right? So from the very, very early days, you know, there were things like the Swift Object Store. And then we got, uh, you know, Eucalyptus was trying to do things beyond EC2. And then, you know, OpenStack had a whole bunch of, you know, capabilities. MinIO showed up. Um, so there's a whole lot of... Um, ways that people have tried to reproduce that infrastructure. I think what Tigris is doing, and, and I think what where there is ripe for optimization, is building on top of the shoulders of giants. You don't have to reinvent S3 to actually add a whole lot of value to the S3 customers. You can rely on that multi-tenanted, incredibly efficient, incredibly durable, incredibly available fleet, and then just enable customers to utilize that fleet even better for their specific workloads. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so going back to what you're saying with S3, and when I think of like, you know, this this new sort of multi-tenanted era, what we're talking about here is, if I consider something like RDS, and let's say I have an RDS database, and I, for whatever reason, I really need to, I have access to Werner Vogels, and I say, show me exactly where my RDS server was. Like theoretically, he could find that, and he could take you to a data center somewhere and be like, okay, your data is like on this specific like server rack thing right here, right? Like he could he could sort of there's like some control plane stuff that's outside yep. of that, but generally he could be like, here's your this is your RDS 
database technically. Whereas like, even if you had access to, you know, Bezos and, and Andy Jassy and Werner Vogels, and you said, show me where my S3 bucket is, they like, couldn't <laughs> do that. Cause it's like, you know, it's split across all these different machines that are in different data centers, like all sorts of things. And like, you know, they could show you a server and say like, hey, this one has some chunk of your data on it along with a hundred other customers data on it and stuff like that. But it's not like, it's not like a specific instance that, that you sort of have and is is yours in some sense, even if it's managed for you, it's like truly just all over the place. Is that is that a useful way to think about it or is that wrong in so many ways? Yeah, I mean, I, I think all over the place is is a good way to think about it. And that's actually where your blast radius is a lot lower. Like all over the place is a feature, not a bug, right? You Your resources on S3 are peanut butter across millions of drives. So Andy Warfield at the FAST conference recently gave this astounding statistic. Tens of thousands of AWS accounts exist where their buckets are spread over a million drives or, or on millions of drives. So let me repeat that. Tens of thousands of customers have buckets spanning millions of drives. Like that's bananas, yeah. <laughs> when a particular machine fails, it's not like all your data goes away with it. And so that peanut buttering, why is that important? Because it allows you to absorb burst, bursty writing, bursty reading, bursty network, right? All of that, like you wanna create a million small objects like that, you're not waiting for new instances to pop up and be allocated to you. They're just there because they're just going to get peanut butter across all of S3's data plane. And that is very, very powerful. So it comes down to how quickly can you kind of absorb the burst. And in a single tenant environment, the only way you can absorb the burst is by over-provisioning and ridiculous amounts of over-provisioning. And multi-tenanted world, you're over-provisioning a little bit, but... You're over provisioning at a fleet wide level and every small customer is kind of helping you smooth out your peak to average ratio and driving down the peak to average ratio helps increase the utilization, which helps you decrease your costs and also optimize the availability and performance for your overall fleet. Yeah. Yeah. And that peak to average, I, so I think I saw Andy Warfield do that S3 talk and he sort of showed that on a graph, like, Hey, here's an individual workload. And like what the peak to average, you know, huge bands. Now here's if you put like 10 of them together, you know, smaller bands. And here's if you put a thousand of them together and it's, it's like almost a flat line, right? Like there's not that much difference between that because once you aggregate those out, they really, they really smooth, uh, they smooth it out quite a bit. So, I mean, I like multi-tenant, like I like Dynamo, right? And, and so like, I'm like familiar with multi-tenancy, S3, Memento is that same way. But like, why don't we have more multi-tenant systems. Like, I, I feel like we still have a ton of sort of data systems that aren't multi-tenant. And like, is, is there sort of just like certain, I don't want to say databases, but certain, certain, yeah, certain patterns or things like that that are harder to do in a multi-tenant way. Whereas like, you know, the, the splitability of S3 and Dynamo and Memento caching, like makes it easier to multi-tenant or like, well, why don't we have more multi-tenant systems? Multi-tenancy is hard. It's, it's really difficult to get it right. You have to avoid noisy neighbors. You have to have the right throttles. You have to do utilization. And then it's really, really hard as a business to be multi-tenanted because, you know, when you're selling to the world, when you're selling efficiency to the world, like multi-tenanted systems can be, you know, they can cut down your resource utilization by 90%. And it is really, really hard to build a service that takes, you know, four times longer to get to a billion dollars in ARR. The early services like RDS and Elasticash, it's easier for them to get to very, very large revenue numbers because and not, nobody's doing this willfully, right? But like, if you have a lot more idle capacity that people are buying, then guess what? They're buying 10 times more capacity than they need. So from a business perspective, it is really, really hard to justify more multi-tenanted services. It's not impossible, but it is harder from a engineering perspective, it is much, much more difficult to build a multi-tenanted system to deal with all of the uh, isolation. But over time, everything is going to go towards multi-tenancy. It's just a matter of who's able to take the leap first and, and kind of get there. And we see transitions happening in this. So, you know, RDS, single-tenanted, single sure. Aurora, the end storage system underneath the covers, 
It's completely multi-tenanted. So sometimes it takes longer to, you know, to get to a point where the competitive landscape is, you know, competitive enough that you have to go down that path of more efficiency. But it is a little bit harder to kind of bootstrap and and, and kickstart a multi-tenanted environment. Gotcha. How I, I don't know. How- how much do you know about and how much can you talk about <laughs> Aurora's storage system? Like what's what's going on underneath there as sort of like how it's working in a multi-tenant way or, or just like how it's working generally? Yeah, I mean, one of the beautiful things about Aurora is that it decouples the compute from the from the storage. So you can have multi-AZ replication without having, you know, Aurora nodes in multiple uh, AZs. That itself is really efficient. So if you look at RDS, the only way you're going to get multi-AZ replication is by having two RDS instances, one in each AZ. That's because it's just those two instances that are you know, doing your replication for you. And by the way, if one of those goes down, well, that's 50% of your fleet. Gotcha. And sorry, so you're, say, you're saying Aurora can have multi-AZ storage without Aurora nodes in multiple AZs, without multiple Aurora compute nodes, but they do have multiple storage nodes in there, but it's like they can... Yeah, they have storage nodes all over. Right. More customer specific compute nodes, right? Without the customer specific compute nodes because they decouple the storage and the and the compute engine. Now, that storage system is probably one of the best pieces of um um of technology that that that's been built inside of AWS, but it is fundamentally very very powerful because guess what like the compute and database is nice to do queries and so forth, but I think people care a lot more about hey, please don't lose my data and please don't lose the transactional correctness of my data in a database. And decoupling that and making that really crucial part, multi-tenanted, is incredible. Because now, if you want to bring up a new host, well, if the story system already has the data, then you don't have to wait for that node to you know, warm up before it's available. You don't have to wait for it to bring in an entire terabyte of, uh, of data. So. You know, like I think over time, everything is going to go towards multi-tenancy anyway. Um, and and over time, you you might get into a situation where you know EC2 and and a lot, um, you know Fargate and things like that. The the start times will will start to decrease as well. So as the instant start times can uh, can decrease, then you get a lot more efficiencies, regardless in terms of being able to optimize. So, but that's that's just better multi-tenancy at the at the EC2 level as well. You still need to decouple the storage side, I think, and, and make that part multi-tenanted on everything else. Gotcha. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, like when I think of Dynamo, it's like it's multi-tenant up and down the stack. There's like no aspect of that. When you provision something in Dynamo, there's like nothing that is yours. Like the request router is multi-tenant, the, the metadata store, the transaction coordinator, the storage nodes, all that is multi-tenant. Whereas with Aurora storage layer is multi-tenant, but then compute on top is going to be customer specific, whether that's, you know, your main writer node, whether that's your, your read replicas, those are going to be uh, sort of customer specific nodes. That's right. And and there's like multi-tenancy, by the way, up and down, like EBS is a great example of multi-tenancy, right? Like people don't even realize they think they're getting their own drives, but like behind the scenes, there's a whole lot of optimizations that are happening. They're not like going and provisioning you know, individual nodes to to give you that 10 gig drive, right? And um, and you can imagine optimizations where people provision a lot of EBS instances that are like 10 gigs and they they use up less than a gigabyte there, right? So you can you imagine the amount of efficiencies that might be available for somebody to take advantage of? Um, not saying any of those optimizations have been done or not, but like it's a very natural optimization, right? To To not allocate the unprovisioned or the provision but not used blocks in a in a block storage system. So yeah, things go down this path one way or another. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so this might be a good time to talk about Memento, how that fits into multi-tenancy. So you said you said Memento is cache, also like low latency pub sub messaging. Maybe start with the cache aspect. Like are you like what aspects of a cache to you, like, I think people probably gonna th- mostly think Redis, Memcache, like how close are you to those sorts of things? And then like, how does multi-tenancy fit into this? Yeah. Um, so our job at Memento is to reduce the number of boxes in your architectural diagram. 
And we we do end up, you know, swapping out a lot of memcache and, and, and Redis. And, and what happens in, in the Redis and memcache scenarios is you don't have one block for your cache. You have, you know, a cluster, you have shards, you have replicas, and you have you know, the number of replicas that you need based on your environment and, and which AZs they're in and all of that. Like, that's a very, very leaky abstraction that leaks all the way to the SDKs that are now aware of the end-to-end server-side topology. So when you auto-scale and you go up, well, guess what? Your, you know, your SDK has to become aware of that. So we start with a multi-tenanted storage fleet that is basically, instead of allocating the capacity that a customer is asking you to allocate. We do it on demand and we peanut butter that capacity across the fleet. Um, then on the request uh, you know, side, like we have an API gateway that basically does the authentication, does the TLS termination, and then routes the data to the right layer. Now this capacity is also completely multi-tenanted, but it has a couple of other features. It's um, it's got a web server built in and it has fine grain access control, which allows customers to connect their mobile devices or their web browsers directly to Momento, bypassing a whole bunch of like API layers that you would otherwise need to provide. So if you wanted to build a pub sub system with millions of subscribers, you just talk to the Momento web servers and boom, you're you're covered. It also has a whole bunch of like fan out capabilities, like it can, you know, uh cache hot keys and so forth. And all that capacity is sitting in a warm pool on behalf of customers. So if any one of those customers has a spike, you can kind of absorb those spikes based on the capacity that is available on the storage side, as well as on the um, on the request routing or API gateway side. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And I think as part of this, one thing you've you've mentioned offhand before, I haven't dug in far enough on it, is like the benefits of having a deeply integrated control plane and data plane. Maybe talk about like what each of those, like what what you mean by those quickly, and then like why it's useful for them to be like be so deeply integrated, or how you have a deeply integrated memento. What that, yeah, what that means. Yeah. So in the early days um, of AWS, Jeff Barr used to have this awesome slide that used to talk about you have two options when you're provisioning infrastructure. You can kind of under provision, and then you have angry customers, right? And because you have this usage pattern that looks like this, or you can over provision, and then you have an angry CFO. Right. <laughs> and and what happens when you have a spike is you might have an angry both. Like you might anger customers and your CFO because you had all this capacity that was provisioned this whole time, but it wasn't there when you needed it. Right. So the the integrated, you know, data plane is a um, you know, it's a set of capacity that's that's made available on the storage side, as well as the ability to extract that storage at a very, very high. TPS. But the control plane comes into play to make sure that the fleet-wide health is managed appropriately. It's the thing that is making sure that you have enough capacity across the fleet. You have enough capacity for every single cache that is out there. And it is the thing that informs our uh, API gateway layer to with the latest topology changes for any given cache. This you know, tight integration between the control plane and the and the data plane allows us to make our clients much, much simpler because now they don't have to worry about the server-side topology and we don't have to worry about different clients having different ideas of what the state of the world looks like. So we can make changes really, really fast behind the scenes because we have a tight control over the messaging to the API gateway layers and we can be assured that data is route, getting routed immediately with the latest apology in mind. Yep, yep. I like that. I think you said, man, I'm just picking something. Like the fact that that control plane and data plane is is so tightly integrated. As comp- like I would compare it to, let's think like RDS, right? Where there's an RDS control plane where I go, maybe I go to the console or I use CloudFormation or something like that, and I say provision me a RDS instance, and it's sort of a control plane sort of manage that and spins it up, and then the data plane is the instance itself, which I'm doing operations against. But then if I start hitting that too hard, you know, it's not going to like know how to help help fix that in any way, right? If, if I say like, if I'm like overloading my database, maybe I'm hitting a certain key too much or, or, or a certain record too much or something like that. 
there's not much I can do. Like I have to sort of go to the control plane and say, hey, go do this action. Whereas if I think of DynamoDB, you know, and you look at like adaptive capacity and things that they're doing where they realize there's like a specific partition where that item's just getting hammered. A couple of items are getting hammered and they can sort of split those partitions into different ones because there's like that connective tissue between the data plane and the control plane. And that data plane, it's like serving these requests, but it's also saying to the control plane, hey, like we're hitting some issues here. It's it's like these keys that are that are getting these issues. And now the control plane is able to like adapt to that sort of thing. Does it, am I understanding that correctly or am I am I like way off base here? No, I, I think you are. And the way I like to frame it is there are shallow control planes that are mostly um, operating at a compute level, right? They're like, okay, does this have enough compute and does this have enough storage? That's it. And they, you know, like they don't have any idea of how you're distributing the data across your multiple shards. That's not up to those shallow control planes. They don't, they're unaware blissfully of whether you have hot keys. They're unaware of, you know, what your uh, shard utilization is. Like if one shard is busier than other because of storage, they don't care. That's not that sh shallow control planes problem. Now a deep control plane is operating at the resource level. So for S3, you know, I got to make sure that my, like all buckets, all customers are, um, have enough capacity, right? It doesn't matter how many shards are in their S3 bucket. That's S3 team's problem. Same thing for Dynamo. You can have one of your DynamoDB partitions get really ballooned up, but that's not your problem because Dynamo will automatically, you know, split for space and boom, you got, you got that split. So to me, it's more about deep control planes that are aware of the primitive on which they're offering a service as opposed to a, a shallow control plane that's built for compute and storage only. Yeah. For when we're talking about like open source data infrastructure, databases, things like that, like, listen, I like open source. I think it's useful, but I think it also um, limits, I guess, like how deep that integration can be. Like, do you, do you sort of agree? I, I just think of like the switch from original Dynamo from AWS, from Amazon.com, right? Where each team was sort of running its own Dynamo and they had to like simplify it operationally in some ways to make that work. And then like DynamoDB itself, where they're like, hey, we're running it for you. It's not gonna be open source. It's not gonna be provided to Amazon.com teams. And because of that, we can have like this deeper integration between that. Like, do you think that's a, is, is it gonna be possible, like doable for an open source database to have that sort of deep integration between data plane and control plane? Or is that something that can really only happen when you have, you know, a, a more proprietary database. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it's inevitable. I, I, I think people often focus on the data plane side of open source, right? And if you look at all the data plane, all these uh, open source companies, um, sure, I can give you my data plane and then you can figure out how to run it or they vend a managed control plane service. Um, and that's usually proprietary because the, like a lot of the value is not the, uh, not the actual data plane. It's the management of the data plane. It's the on calls that are, are keeping the fleet healthy. It's like when, um, you know, you buy a car, if I made your car free, it actually doesn't help you as much, um, because you're a lot of your costs, unless you're buying really fancy cars, but if you're like an average American, most of your cost is actually operational. It's the gas that you're putting into that thing, right? So, and, and the insurance that you're, you're paying for and the parking spot that you're paying for if you're living in Boston or something like that, right? Like the operational cost is where the meat is. Like, so sure, like you can have the, the data plane, but it's, it's the control plane that, that ends up making the, the bigger difference. I don't think they are um, mutually exclusive. Like you could open source control planes, but that's generally quite rare. Yeah. And it's, and it's kind of weird because it's like, Hey, if I'm going to go run my, my own database, it's probably going to be in more of a single tenant manner rather than I'm, like, you're just not going to, I think probably to make it, to take advantage of the integrated control plane and data plane, you probably need multiple tenants where they're sharing capacity in some sense. And then you could be over provisioned a little bit, but, but like you're saying, spread it around and different things. So it's probably just like, it, it's weird. 
I don't want to say like weird incentives. Or it's just like weird. Um, yeah, it's just I think, I think it's harder to make a multi-tenant system open source. Like, do you know any examples of open tenant system or multi-tenant systems that are open source? They probably exist, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, you can do multi-tenancy on your own, right? So Momento, for what it's worth, we do, we, we're big believers in cellular architectures. And we have this really interesting combination that gives the best of both worlds to customers where we can do private multi-tenancy where large customers are large enough that they have enough workflows within their organization that they can kind of absorb the load uh, between their own workloads. Um, but And they don't need to you know, compromise any security or, or data mixing you know, by, by sharing a cell with, um, with different customers. And you'd be surprised, like, you know, even... As, long, as soon as customers are running dozens of instances for, for their Elastic Cache plus their web servers, like a private multi-tenant itself can actually bring meaningful efficiencies into, into their ecosystem. And if you really live by the cellular architecture, like all you're trying to do is improve resource utilization. And multi-tenancy is just a means to improve resource utilization. And, you know, if you improve do multi-tenancy at a smaller scale with just that customer's account, that's still meaningful efficiency gains for them. Yep, yep. You mentioned cellular architecture, which is something I hear you and just every AWS person talk about all the time, but I, I still feel like it's like under-talked about outside of AWS. So like, what is cellular architecture? Yeah, um, so cellular architecture got uh, evangelized inside of AWS uh, uh, as a means to reduce blast radius for services. So we have very large services at AWS and you don't ever want to have a regional failure for one of those, you know, tier zero services. And the idea was that, you know, instead of having one big regional deployment, you would have lots of small ones and then you would shuffle shard the customers between them so that you can, um, you know, like you reduce the blast radius. If one of those cells goes down, it's not like you have a regional outage for every single AWS customer. AWS regions have gotten quite large now, right? So if the regional failures are catastrophic consequences on our economy for that matter, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So that's how it started. But then there's a lot of other benefits uh, around, um, you know, like scale. Because then a given cell is not going to be, you know, meaningfully large. So then it becomes a unit of deployment as well. And um, it was, um, you know, the person leading it at Amazon was uh, Peter Voschel, who was the first distinguished engineer at Amazon. And he he really led the way in making sure that all of the services, especially the new ones that were coming out, have been cellularized. And we went as far as saying the internal company goals were a, a service ought to be able to whip up a new cell in less than four hours. So go all in. Like you can only do cellular architecture if you're really good at infrastructure as code. Like your entire cell has to be, you know, ready to go where you can just click something, deploy it, and boom, four hours later, all the limits and everything is, is there and ready to go. And once you get to that part, then you have the ability to whip up cells that are dedicated to a specific customer. Um, a cell is typically also encapsulated in its own AWS account. So even if that AWS account goes away, it's just limited to that one cell. So it's about blast radius reduction. It's about um, scale units um, and just isolation in general. Okay. So then what you're saying like in US East 1, S3 is not just one giant system, but it's a lot of cells. Each one, like each one replicates sort of the entire system, but those cells are essentially completely independent from each other. I don't know if S3 has gone in all in on cellularization or not, but I can tell you that's the intent that uh, that's supposed to be. Uh, Dynamo in a region has lots and lots of deployments. Okay, so okay, so let's talk about Dynamo. If you can talk about that one, like. How many cells are we talking about? Are we talking like tens? Are we talking like <laughs> tens of thousands? Like, can you give me like the order of magnitude? And, and you know, I know this doesn't have to be exact, but like, just like, is it closer to 10 or 10,000 or a million? Or like, how many cells are we sort of talking about just to give people a... a... No, I, I think, you know, it really varies on on each service. But I think in inside of Amazon regions, I think you're like 
five cells is is pretty good for a, a given region because that reduces your blast radius down from 100% down to down to like 20%, right? And then like getting that next 5x, uh, you know, um, boost is like 25 cells. And then like, remember, there's so many AWS regions, right? So not every region, like some regions are going to be small enough to be your, your smallest cell. And one of the things, so, you know, that's the order I would, I would imagine now in Memento. Gotcha. So it's, it's not, it's not like you're adding a cell every month or something like that. Like no, adding a new cell no. is a pretty rare situation and it's still like, yeah, it, it's not like cells as, uh, it's not like they're, uh, was it cattle, not pets? It's not like a, a cell is cattle or something like that. Where it's no, you can't treat a cell like cattle either, because that's the that's the other thing, right? Like because then it's like, well, you can't sacrifice these cells either. Um, the um, you know, going from one region like to two cells is the hardest part. Once you get there, um, then you know you can create cells, and then like you know, there's a whole lot of design uh, choices that are still left available to the to the developers, you know, like how do you distribute data between different cells or how do you, how do you, you know, decide who goes in, uh, in which cell? Some services will say, okay, like, um, I'll put, you know, each customer can have each resource. Like if you, let's say in a hypothetical case of a service that had a, a bucket, you can say like, okay, a bucket is in a cell. So you can have one customer be available in every single one of your cells because, you know, you deploy a bucket to a, a different cell. Or you can say, I'm going to isolate a customer to their cell and, you know, all of their buckets are going to be in that particular cell. So there's all kinds of like trade-offs. Uh, and then how do you do the routing? How do you actually make sure that the um, the global mapping is is um, is set up appropriately and whatnot? So it's a yeah, on, on that sort of question, like let's talk about Dynamo a little bit. Let's say US East 1, let's just say they have five cells. I'm not sure. But where does that split happen? Like, if I think of a Dynamo request, like it hits the load balancer, then request router, and then down. Are the load balancers cellularized? Are those across all the cells? Or like a request routers, you know, across all the like how like when when do I have to look up this request came in from Alex and I need to figure out which cell he belongs to? Where does that lookup happen? So here's the thing: um, the services, a, a little decoder that you can use, is services that, that give you a unique DNS entry for your endpoint are the ones that have the easiest time like routing you to an entirely contained cell. Um, services that are a little more complex, they don't have to cellularize at the entire service level. So you can cellularize at the storage node level in Dynamo. You can cellularize at the request router level. You can cellularize at the control plane, you know, cache or, or um, uh, auto admin level as well. So it's completely up to the teams in terms of how, how they, um, they sell are. So like in the case of like media convert, for instance, you get, you know, an endpoint and that endpoint determines which cell you're, you're going to, uh, a lot of the, like, so all the media services that got built, uh, at elemental, for instance, for AWS, they were all cellularized and they, what we tried to do was to hand customer a specific endpoint, which allows us to like move their stuff around as well to a certain extent. But for the other services, the cellularization may not be happening at the entire service level. It might be happening at the, at the component level. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting because I've been, I've been sort of using as like a intuitive sense for people as to like whether you're using a multi-tenant or a single tenant piece of infrastructure from AWS is like, do you have a unique DNS name you're hitting rather than uh, a separate, like I always say like Dynamo, you know, you're hitting dynamo.us east one dot Amazon AWS and it's a multi-tenant service. Same thing with S3. Whereas like if you go provision RDS or Aurora, they give you like, you know, a bunch, you know, some unique identifier dot Aurora dot whatever. Or an NLB for that matter, right? Like when you provision an NLB, you get your own little um, endpoint that they can use to change to a, a different cell, different, you know, instance that might be routing your your capacity as well. Yeah. But, but anyway, it sounds like my intuition is is wrong. Like even some you might have a service that gives you sort of a unique DNS entry, but that doesn't mean it's it's necessarily a single tenant service that you're hitting because it could be, you know, that DNS entry is routing to a cell rather than routing to a, you know, your sort of RDS compute instance or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, at that point, it's like, you know, we, which control plane is managing those? What is the deployment unit? So again, it comes down, for cell architecture, it just comes down to reducing the blast radius and isolation, right? Um, so, and 
every service, you know, is going to go about their own ways to to achieve those objectives. Yeah, I feel like I don't know. I don't know if this is true or just intuition, but I feel like we've had fewer region wide service disruptions in AWS over the last, let's say, five years. Um, do you think that is true? And if so, like, is that a, a consequence of cellular architecture where maybe, hey, maybe a cell is going to be having trouble, but it's it's rare now, it seems like, to have a full region-wide thing. And like, is that related to cellular stuff or is that just related to, you know, they, they're, you know, you keep doing COEs for 15 years and things are going to get just pretty hardened and things like that. I I don't know if you can pin it to a single thing. Um, every day that AWS gets without an outage is a day that should be celebrated because the the sheer scale at which AWS is is operating at and the sheer number of mission critical workloads that run on AWS it's just really really impressive. And the fifteen years of operational excellence, the COE, the dive deep, the ownership of all the operators that go in and proactively mitigate issues before they become problems that take down the world. Like there, there's a whole lot that goes into making AWS what it is uh, today. And I, I just, I can't pin it on how it happens, but it is incredibly magical. The level of availability that AWS has been able to pull off um, over the years. And there has been outages, but it's just, you know, they, they've gotten better with every single one of them. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's. You talked about cellular a little bit. You've also mentioned to me before that most people are doing cross AZ wrong. I haven't gotten into this with you, but like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I doing cross AZ blindly is is actually a very dangerous practice. So specifically, AZs don't go down that often. So you have to start with well, why why do you want to go multi AZ? And if the answer is because an, an AZ might go down, that doesn't happen as often. What does happen more often is cross AZ packet losses that get elevated or cross AZ disconnects that happen there. They don't happen much, but they, they happen a lot more often than you know an entire AZ going down. Um, and then you start thinking, about, okay, well, what are the consequences of the of this design that I that I chose to go multi AZ? Well. Two cents a gigabyte, that gets very expensive very fast. But, you know, you add a millisecond or so of latency of going across AZ, so now your performance is getting interesting. Then you start looking at performance at the tail because of those packet losses. You start to have availability issues as well, or like really bad, you know, like TCP, which you transmits at 200 milliseconds. Like things start to get really bad, and they will happen a lot more often across AZs. The more devices you're going across, the more... Um, you know, hops you have, and the more likely you are to have one of those be uh, be struggling. So you got to work backwards from the problem. If the problem that you're working backwards from is multi AZ, like resiliency, uh, there are other patterns that you can use. For example, I like to promote this notion of you know uh, AZ uh, specific swim lanes. So a swim lane that is entirely contained in the AZ where the database, the cache, and the web server are living in, you know, entirely in one AZ. And, you know, sure, you can have, at some point, you need to replicate the data across, but at least your cache and your web server can be living in the, uh, in the same AZ so that you can absorb some of those, those outages further. Now, as soon as you do that, your performance, your availability, and your cost have a meaningful improvement as well. Um, and it's much better than unnecessary hops across AZs, uh, which have their their consequences. Yeah. Okay. Well, that brings up that brings you to my favorite question, which I ask about a, a million people whenever they bring up cross AZ costs. What's going on there? Is that a, is that a legit valid cost? Is it sort of um, I don't want to say like rent seeking from AWS, but is it like you know that they are able to take advantage of that? Like, what's going on with cross AZ? Uh, costs in your opinion? So cross AZ is actually quite an expensive endeavor when what we see at two cents per gig might look really, really expensive. But what we have to appreciate is that AWS is absorbing the peak to average ratios there. And I can be sitting idle, not sending any data across the AZs, and then I can start a multi gigabit per second workload and push that through. And the rate that Amazon is giving me is not the sustained rate, right? 
it's the it's giving me on demand pricing. Now, what I wish I could do is pay for a pipe. And, you know, in some cases, like if I don't have a very high peak to average ratio, I would love to just, you know, buy a direct connect between AZs and just pay Amazon on those. But I'm telling you, for almost every customer, that direct pipe will cost you more than the two cents per gig. So it's easy to, you know, it, it looks really, really expensive, but the underlying infrastructure that is required to to give you that elasticity and that burst is actually quite expensive. And the level of innovation that AWS has to do to make that as seamless as possible is also quite expensive. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. What I guess one other place I, I hear people complain about it is like if they're running their own Kafka clusters or if they... Maybe if they're even a provider of Kafka clusters for someone else, and they say, "Well, if you look at MSK, Amazon's managed managed Kafka managed streaming for Kafka or whatever that is, they don't charge inter- across AZ stuff, so it's 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 like not cost competitive for us if we want to run it on EC2 compared to that. Like, is that valid? Is is I mean, is that sort of priced into what's going on with MSK or what's going on there? It's priced in, and MSK." reduces its peak to average ratio by being multi-tenanted too. There you go. Right? So as a service, you know, you're, as a customer, you end up having much lower peak to average ratio that you're, you know, that you're throwing onto the network team, right? So it it comes down, (laughs) maybe I'm a multi-tenancy parrot, but, uh, you know, it's it's, um, same thing for for S3, same thing for, uh, you know, Elastic Cash. If you look at the Elastic Cash AWS account, their peak to average ratio is going to be a lot lower than you pick a random high utilization elastic cash customer that's going like this, right? So as a customer, the AWS services are better customers of the AWS networking stack than a single tenanted workflow. So that's kind of baked into it. And then, yeah, it's baked into the pricing. Like elastic cash is 104% premium on your EC2 instance. Of course, that's covering some of the, um, you know, the network capacity that you would otherwise pay. Furthermore, like if you look at things like ElastiCash, you know, ElastiCash will absorb, like it'll replicate across the AZs for you for free, but your gets, you still have to pay for. So you still have to pay for your half of the of the gets. So you still pay one cent a gig for any reads that you send across AZs. And a lot of customers don't know to try to create that AZ specific swim lane that you can use to actually meaningfully reduce your AWS spend if you just if you do everything else the same but just have your web server route to the local AZ and save a bunch of money. Yeah, yeah. On that same sort of note, especially what I mentioned with Kafka earlier, um, one thing I like to ask like data infra founders is you are both like a huge user of the cloud but then also like a, a competitor of the cloud because they have a competitive product. Like what, how is that relationship? Are the clouds like pretty good partners on that stuff? Is it, is it tense? Like what does that sort of look like, um, your relationship there? We are, we're certainly competitors, but we're like, cloud is also an enabler, right? Like so many of the startups just wouldn't exist without the cloud providers. You look at like, you know, let's go back 18 years. Like there was how many, you know, tech infra startups existed. It's not just because there's more money and more innovation is happening. Like the level of experimentation that can happen is meaningfully higher as well. Now, of course, they have some advantages that that we don't have, right? And you know, and and, and you rely on them to to continue to play to play fair. Um, but at the same time, I have to remain appreciative of the fact that they have created this ecosystem that um, that I can use to to innovate and and add value to to my customers and, and make money for my shareholders. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, sort of on that same note, I've been thinking like, have we been seeing seeing enough improvements from the clouds in the last couple of years? Because I feel like you know, from oh six oh eight to fourteen or eighteen, maybe it was just like you know gangbusters all the time i guess like have we seen enough pricing improvements we don't see much we don't see many price decreases anymore um should we be seeing more given like just you know the advances in in storage and and network and and also in cpu all sorts of stuff like should we be seeing um improvements there the ec2 prices might look the same but the capacity is getting better Right, so CPUs are are much nicer. The network is much nicer. The the 
not just on the bandwidth side, but just the packets per second that can be handled, the the latency. So there's a whole lot that that's coming in for free. Now that said, AWS and the cloud providers are able to test more price elasticity because now they are no longer fighting to become the incumbent. They are the incumbent. So that allows them to charge premiums that they couldn't have charged 15 years ago. All right. So, but that also creates an opportunity for startups to show up and, and compete by making efficient use of the infrastructure. Um, and it's a nice symbiotic kind of ecosystem in that regards. Yeah. Yeah. What about just in terms of like, are we seeing enough hardware improvements? And, and so today's February 26th last year on hacker or last week, sorry, on hacker news, there was an article about, uh, it was called SSDs are fast, except in the cloud. And it's talking about how like NVMEs can be doing like 10 to 13 gigs per second of, of sort of read throughput. Whereas like in AWS and Azure, you're getting maybe two or three gigs per second. Um, I guess like what, what's, is there more to, the, I don't know enough about hardware to know if that's like a valid claim or, or if something else, like I wouldn't think that sort of the clouds would, would just be holding it back or, or not improving it intentionally like maybe maybe there's not enough demand for it maybe it's too expensive i guess like i don't know do you have any thoughts on like is the hardware improving as fast as you would expect um i, I customers are always going to want things faster and cheaper that's the two axioms from jeff bezos right like those are undeniable truths they'll always happen um the good news is that there are multiple cloud providers that are vying for your business so if an, a technology existed and that was in high demand, they would be trying to one-up each other and make it available faster. But there's a whole lot of things that go into the equation. You have to have enough scale. You have to be able to get enough capacity. You have to make it available to everybody. And right now, the whole world is in a capacity crunch because compute consumption and storage consumption is just going through the roof with the, with the AI revolution. So I, I don't think any cloud has an incentive not to make NVMEs or, or, or faster drives available to you. Now, there's been a bunch of really nice novel, you know, innovations that have happened. Like, you know, all the Nitro and the, the Graviton stuff, like your memory is encrypted by default on those instances. Your drives are encrypted by default. So, you know, there's a whole lot of other things that are happening on the cloud providers. And yes, the hypervisor gets in the way. And yes, there's some things in the way. But like, at the end of the day, if the capacity exists and if the innovation exists, like it will become available in the cloud at the for the masses. How much do you know about Elasticsearch? What would you like to know? I don't. So I just I just spoke with someone from Elasticsearch, and it was super useful. Like explained a bunch of stuff to me. Um, but I wonder why we can't have sort of a a, a better like a, a more cloud native Elasticsearch. Like it kind of reminds me of Dynamo pre Dynamo DB in some ways. Like just just think about like. It's, it's kind of man, like they're, they're going to shard your data and spread it across these different nodes, but like shard management is pretty manual and it's pretty hard to like increase and decrease. Usually you have to do it by a factor and it's, it's, it's just like kind of a scary operation. And you're, like, you're mostly on your own doing it, right? Um, you're aiming for shard size of like tens of gigabytes, 10 to 50 gigs. Generally, that seems like Dynamo ish in some ways, right? You also have like storage nodes that are doing everything, right? Like a storage node like handles requests and serves as like the request coordinator reaching out to all the other storage nodes, but it's also storing the data itself and like, hey, maybe some separation between like- Doing the scatter gather. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe doing like the request router and, and just separating that out a little bit more. It's also doing like replication is, is like synchronous. Like you scale up reads by having more read replicas and that replication to those read replicas is is mostly synchronous unless you have like some lagging nodes and it'll maybe cut them off. But generally it's synchronous replication, even though you're buffering updates because you're only like flushing to disk, you know, every second or something like that. With that. I don't like, it just seems like almost like a Dynamo-like system, but for Elasticsearch where, you know, Dynamo wants to route every request to a single partition. And what if you made a Dynamo that's like, well, we have to scatter gather every request instead, but we get all these other sort of benefits. I don't know. It just seems like there's there's an opportunity for a better Elasticsearch there. Um, so I used to write a bunch of Lucene code in the back when I worked at NASA. And uh, yeah, I'm very passionate about this particular space. Um, you're right that a Dynamo of Elasticsearch would be just revolutionary. Uh, it is a pretty hard problem, but Dynamo solves hard problems. And the fundamental differentiator here is that it's single tenanted nodes that 
with a leaky abstraction that the clients have to deal with customers as well as their SDKs. And that is what causes the availability issue. That is what causes the capacity crunches. Now imagine a multi-tenanted elastic search where the capacity management was done on your behalf and the customers were kind of sharing each other's spikes, whether it's on compute storage or network, that would be a pretty cool system. And I think it is inevitable that Dynamo will build it. Um, I This is something I wanted to build in Dynamo for a very long time. And I, I think there's been other things to be to be done, but I, I think it's inevitable. I think this is not a decade away, you know, but I, I, I think a Dynamo style elastic search would be nice. But what I would hope for is a built-in full text index inside of Dynamo DB. That I think would be magical because then you rely on Dynamo for your core storage. And then you have these indexes, which happens to be Dynamo's biggest Achilles heel right now. That would be the most magical system <laughs> that I could imagine. Yep. It's I mean, Mongo is basically doing that, right? Like adding in these other indexy type things on top of that, uh, you know, sharded mostly key-based storage. Um, but they're struggling with the same thing. They're struggling with the same thing that Elasticsearch is struggling. It's a hard problem. Unless you get into that multi-tenanted environment with better capacity planning. Like 99% of the Elasticsearch problems are capacity management. You, if, you can't, if you get the capacity management right and you have enough resources, you'll have a fundamentally better system. Yep, I know. It is, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just surprised there hasn't been sort of more traction on on that so like there are a few like sort of managed shafts search providers but they're just like not quite a i don't know i just none of them are like in the realm of of where elastic is at yep there's algolia there's open search there's you know amazon has a product called kendra for you know ai enabled searches and things like that but no like the dynamo of elastic search would be um would be huge i i've been a huge fan of the the elk stack by the way for a very long time so when we launched Dynamo Streams, one of the key integrations was with the Elk stack. So we we made that as part of our launch because we thought, you know, Dyna the marriage of Dynamo and, and full text indexing is um, is quite nice, but I do want it to extend beyond just a, a zero ETL thing. I want it to be built into the database. Yeah. Yeah. That, that reminds me, you you brought up open search and I know you've been um, you've been vocal about um, the use of sort of serverless applied to different AWS databases and things like that. How multi-tenant are these? I would say all the the like branded serverless databases that AWS have, they seem to be like sort of similar architecturally because they have the same flavor in terms of pricing model and, and just like how they sort of uh, scale up, scale down, scale zero, different things like that. I guess like how multi-tenant are those are they multi-tenant at any layer are they or i guess from what you can tell or from what's what's been publicly available about them like what's going on there so multi-tenancy is a really good not definitive but a really good leading indicator for whether something is fake serverless or not and you know if you figure out multi-tenancy appropriately you don't have to tack on serverless as a marketing term you will actually have a serverless service if you're just using it for marketing then it's probably a single tenanted service. I have yet to see a true serverless service that is not multi-tenanted. SQS multi-tenanted, S3 multi-tenanted, you know, Dynamo multi-tenanted. Dynamo, when it wants to be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so what's going on with those, those serverless uh, you don't have to talk about Elastic Cloud Services, but maybe talk about Open Search or or any of them. Like, are are they like mostly single tenanted and and just like auto scaling up and down, or like what's are they using Aurora storage, but still like just the compute is sort of hard to scale. I mean, you you go down to to the documentation of Open Search and and uh, Aurora Serverless, and they will tell you what a or a Neptune like a, what a Neptune capacity unit, what instance it maps to. You can literally find official documentation that maps the you know specific units to instance types. Where I'm like, okay, now you're just calling an instance something different. You know, a rose by any other name would still smell just as sweet, and an instance with a different name, like a capacity unit, still a lot of operational pain. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Have you? I guess I don't know how much is out there about the new like Aurora Limitless database. Did you see that at reInvent? Do you have Do you have any sense on like what's going on there? Yeah. 
That's, I think that's heading in the right direction. I think that's, and, and like I said, because of the underlying storage system that Aurora has, like it's a lot easier for them to, to pull this off. And I, and you know, like I would check out Caspian, which was, uh, I think, I think it was Peter's keynote that he talked about that. But like, you know, systems like that make me really excited that the world is moving towards a multi-tenanted, you know, that we as, you know, a society are moving towards a more multi-tenanted infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that also reminds me, uh, speaking of reInvent, S3 Express One Zone. I've asked a few people, like, you, you've you written some great stuff on it. What are your thoughts there on, like, where's a good fit? Or is it is it just like, you know, it's an early entrant, but it needs to be changed? Like, what, what do you think about S3 Express One Zone? Oh, I, I am so impressed by the S3 team that they started with a clean sheet of paper. They they did not respect anything that was already set in stone, right? New authentication protocol, you know, single AZ, by the way, not multi-AZ, right? It's actually ridiculously fast. So it is an incredible product. I am so proud of that team to, to pull that out. It's a, it's the best, you know, uh, AWS offering for an actual serverless cache because you can, write stuff and grab it out and you don't have to worry about anything. So official AWS. Now, the downsides of it are, are very simple. Like if you have an object that's like you're writing a lot, you have to pay for that object, you know, for at least an hour. So like if you have something like a counter or something, you know, where you're incrementing it over and over and over again, you'll go bankrupt pretty quickly. But there's no capacity units or anything like that. So if you've got like objects where the life cycle is on the order of an hour, like it is really, really good. Um, and you know, the price is actually not bad either. So um, I, I hope more people use it. And if you're creating that AZ specific swim lane concept, like the single AZ S3 is, uh, is quite, quite beautiful. Yeah, that's interesting. I've, I, a few people, both the Warpstream guys and um, material, Nikhil from Materialize, they were both saying, hey, interesting. I think the two big hangups for them are just pricing a little bit. It's still a little too expensive. And then... Uh, they don't feel great about just being one AZ. They want they, like they're saying, "Hey, in reality, we're going to write it to two AZs just to make sure we we have it." And um, and now you know now that doubles your costs on that as well. So oh, I don't think they're writing to two AZs. I think if they're telling you it's one zone, it's probably one zone. No, no, no. They're saying the, the warp stream and materialized people are saying if we would use this, we would want to write it to two AZs to make sure if one AZ goes. Down. And then because of that, now we need to double our costs, and and it's you know double our costs and just more stuff we're doing and dealing with those failures and things like that. So because of that, um, yeah, I think they're excited about it, but, but still. For things like warp stream, I would keep like, you know, they're very tail heavy. So I would keep the tail stuff in a cache, like a memento or, or local caches and then use S3 for the back end. That's not, I think, uh, cause for that kind of workload, like memory is fine. Right. And, um, uh, and it's not that expensive because you're not like, you've got like, months of data that you're storing in S3, but your most recent data is what needs to be the hottest, you know, you can keep it in um, uh, in memory. Yep, yep, okay. All right, cool, we're running up on time. So I gotta, I gotta close with, you know, I have, we have six sort of rapid fire questions that we ask everyone. Um, so we'll go through these. If you could master one skill you don't have right now, what would it be? Um, so many. <laughs> Uh, I would like to really get good at one thing and, and instead of trying to do too many things at once. <laughs> so I, I would like to master one thing, anything it is. Like if I can master one thing, I would be very happy. I try to be too broad and, um, you know, I would like to master one skill. I don't know what it is yet. And it's not pickleball. You're multi-tenanting your skills inside of you, right? That's right. All these... <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I haven't heard that one. So that's good. Um, what wastes the most time in your day? I think driving is the biggest waste of time because I can't, you know, do multiple things at once. Um, and I never realized that until I started working from home that how much time we actually waste in driving has made me appreciate everything from getting my food delivered to my groceries delivered. If I don't have to drive, I can just walk everywhere and, you know, get healthier. So I, I try to do as much as I can on a walk and avoid driving as much as possible. I cannot force myself to pay delivery fees like it just like something inside of me is just like i can't do it like i, I will order takeout and i will go pick it up every time because i just like can't I, I can't do it that's the only thing 
I, I made a mathematical model, man. Like you, you, if you, you should just try to allocate a very modest hourly fee to your time and then decide if the DoorDash fee is worth it or not. The other thing is uh, I, I like a love podcast. So being in the car and just listening to a podcast, like I, I work from home all the time, so I don't get that much podcast time. So then it's like, oh, I'll go drive for 15, 20 minutes and get some podcasting in. So. But if you walked, if you walked instead while listening to those podcasts, you know, you're, it'll cut down your, uh, your healthcare costs down the line and you'll recuperate all of the delivery fees. It's better for the environment too. That's true. That's true. I don't drive very much, but um, I, I can't, I just can't uh, do delivery. Um, all right. Next one. If you can invest in one company, it's not Memento. It's not a public company. I want to know like a private company. If you could invest in any one private company, what would it be? Yeah. I'm, I'm personally, I'm very excited about Warpstream. I am very excited about Warpstream. I think they've got a, a good product. Um, I, I heard about it, uh, you know, before the announcement came out and I got very excited because they are solving that uh, uh, that AZ specific swim lane problem. The AZ brain, and just the the operational. They're making it so much like those those Kafka brokers now. They're stateless, right? Like any like you can just scale them up, scale them down. All the storage is in S three. You don't worry about that. Like that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So I like that answer. You're the second person to give that answer in the last week. So I think they got something going on. Um, what tool or technology can you not live without? My phone. I spend a lot of time on my phone and that's not just to watch like YouTube videos or, or podcasts, but um, when I travel, I try to not lose a second of productivity. And that's why, that's the other reason why I don't like to drive. Like if I'm on a train or on a plane, I am constantly on and it keeps me connected. Um, it is, it's, it's a double-edged sword for sure, but you know, having the phone and I've recently learned that, you know, it's the thing that you spend the most time with if you're in tech. So it's worthwhile to have, you know, something with the best battery and, and so forth available to you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, which person influenced you the most in your career? I took a lot of lessons and learnings from one of my old bosses, um, Raju Gulabani. He he was never easy on me and, and uh, you know, always told me as it is. But he, Raju used to run all databases and AI at, uh, at AWS, and he's a very tough manager to have. And I really enjoy having, you know, tough managers. And um, he's kind of helped me understand how to do product definition, how to think more aggressively about the competitive landscape, and how to, you know, focus on, on the product side. And he's still very, very generous with his time and, you know, mentors me, even though he's you know, not even working full time anymore. So I've always been appreciative, but there's a lot of people that have influenced me and, and basically provide free mentorship that's, that I haven't really earned yet. You're one of them. And, um, you know, so it's always nice to have people that are, uh, that are just there to help you out. Yep. Yep. Cool. I, I, I feel like you need a hard, uh, a pretty strict person in charge of databases, right? You want to make sure that those are working well. You don't, <laughs> you don't want something like that. So that's, yeah, that's a great one. Um, all right, last one. AI, of course, very popular over the last um, year and a half or so. What is your probability that AI equals doom for the human race? Zero. Zero? Nice. I like it. Optimism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you... you I, Technology can be doomed for humans too, but like AI, it's going to create more jobs. It's going to, it's going to make us so much more efficient. It's going to accelerate innovation. Like it's, it's not a, like we're, we're so far away from, from the doom that it's just not worth worrying about. Yeah. Okay. So you're not, you're not bombing data centers or anything like that right now. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> Also, I agree with you. I'm an optimist. I, I think it's pretty exciting what's going on. So, uh, Quaja, this has been great. I always love talking to you and it's good to get, get some of this in recording so other people can hear it as well. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, more about Memento, where should they look? GoMomento.com. And, and follow Quaja on, on, on the Twitters as well. We'll put, we'll put both of those in the show notes. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. It was, it was great chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me.